much. Uh, and uh, my pleasure to welcome you all in this um, in this webinar in this current scenario you have uh, uh, actually this i'm very much honored to be the part of this uh, webinar uh, on automation is everywhere towards building a safe and robust software paradigm organized by department of computer science in association with iqsc Ashutosh College and co-hosted by IEEE Computer Society and IEEE Young Professionals Kolkata section. As we know that um, Ashutosh College, the dream of Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, the visionary that materialized on the 17th uh, of July 1916 has now reached the centennial milestone with nearly about uh, 6,000 students and about um, 250 faculty members, along with 180 non-teaching staff members involved in the teaching learning process uh, in more than 28 subjects, including undergraduate studies, postgraduate studies, diploma, certificate, BVOC community college and add-on courses. And this department, this computer science department is actually a very pride possession of the Ashutosh College, not only in Kolkata, but also in respect of West Bengal and in Eastern India. So I wish computer science department, uh, the department team, all the very best for this brilliant endeavor. And I believe that uh, the students uh, would uh, actually really benefit a lot from this webinar. And I will not waste time. On behalf of Ashutosh College, I would like to welcome and express our sincere gratitude to the esteemed speaker, Dr. Rajdeep Mukherjee. And finally, I would like to wish you all the very best on behalf of Ashutosh College, every success of this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, to take a few, uh, few time and for some time from your busy schedule to, and give a speech in this seminar. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now, I would like to request uh, Professor Gautam Mohabatro, uh, Associate Professor of Computer Science Department, and also one of the senior most faculty of Computer Science Department, to kindly say a few words and grace this session. Sir, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm not uh, actually putting on my video. Actually, mm, this is a great pleasure to me for getting Rajdeep as a, mm, actually Rajdeep Mukherjee, my actually dear, one of the best student to, uh, that is, as a speaker of the today's program. Actually, uh, Rajdeep, um, towards the Rajdeep, actually, Rajdeep uh, is a, uh, just like a um, pioneer of some uh, work. Actually, uh, during his undergraduate, uh, he, is a, he is a student of our department. So, at the undergraduate level, uh, actually, he uh, actually uh, there is a project on. Um, one type of uh, today's seminar that is autonomous, autonomous, sorry, automation. At that time, we are uh, looking for uh, just uh, sunflower technology to get the uh, solar light. That is solar light uh, as a hybridized uh, light. Uh, that is solar light and uh, that is current elect electricity will be combined to form uh, to produce the light during daytime. Uh, that was the actual um, our project idea. So we have uh, done some part of the job, but not the complete one. This is the first step for autonomy at uh, at that time. Okay, the, the, the Rajdeep uh, in his, in his batch basically in his batch it's a uh, really it's a good batch for the computer science department, computer science uh, in Calcutta University. Uh, so many, so many students are there. Uh, all over, uh, they are working in all over the world. Actually, different Intel from Intel, Amazon, and other organizations also. 
and um, okay now we are we'll, uh, this is the my introduction about the rajdeep and, and actually i am welcoming everyone to my department uh, to my department actually uh, asked this college computer science department and um, actually uh, when rajdeep has come uh, when rajdeep is coming uh, in india at the time uh, uh, I, 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 we, we always in discussion. Uh, most of the time, we are in contact. So when the, he is coming, uh, planning to come uh, in the India, that uh, time I am proposing that um, actually uh, in COVID situation, the, the uh, teaching, that is manual teaching, uh, just has started. Uh, so I am planning to uh, organize a seminar, manual that is offline seminar, in my department to. Give uh, actually, and uh, he will be the, the research person. So that is that was my planning, but uh, due to the COVID situation, it is in webinar form. So um, uh, actually, uh, autonomous automation uh, and automation is everywhere. Actually, that is true uh, because of software and other. Uh, that is communication system and computer system development of uh, progress of that uh, technology. But uh, robustness and that is my best thing is actually robu uh, robust uh, solution. Robust autonomous solution is a very important um, uh, challenge and Rajdeep is working in this field. So I think uh, we will be, uh, we must hear, uh, we are very much eager to hear from him. Uh, and. Uh, actually, when I am pro um, talking about the seminar uh, to my uh, head of the department, Somir, uh, Somir Malakar, that uh, he is actually arranging everything. That is, uh, yeah, IEEE um, Computer Society, uh, actually uh, young IEEE and professional. They are our uh, collaboration. Actually, the uh, Samir has uh, arranged everything. And also the department um, faculties and our college department that is IQSC and PG studies, all are supporting us. Our principals also, batch principal also supporting us. Uh, actually, in this way, uh, we are actually um, successful. We are just arranging this type of seminar, uh, webinar based seminar. And this COVID situation also, and I think uh, we will be very much benefit beneficial to hearing. Him. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for Thank letting you. us uh, know more about our guest speaker today. Um, so moving forward, uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Chintan Kumar Mandal, Assistant Professor of Department of Computer Science um, and Engineering in Jadavpur University. He is the chairperson of IEEE Young Professionals Kolkata section, and also he is the executive council member of IEEE Computer Society Kolkata. I would like to request you, sir, to kindly say a few words and grace the session. Sir, uh, thank you, madam. Thank you very much. A warm evening and even a chilly evening, maybe. I, the winter is already moving away from Calcutta. Well, uh, thank you very much for attending this session. I welcome you, everybody, to this uh, webinar on automation is everywhere towards building a safe and robust software paradigm, uh, which is to be given by uh, Dr. Rajdeep Mukherjee, who is also an applied scientist at Amazon USA. Uh, well, uh, automation being the keyword and also the buzzword nowadays, this uh, lecture or this webinar, which will be uh, which will be present to you, presented to you by Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee, uh, is a uh, is something which uh, one can or one should always listen to or which should, or one should always know about it because it is the buzzword and every today every scientist and every technologist is basically running towards. Uh, trying to make everything or anything around him or her to be automated. Uh, today, I'll, I'll 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 basically give you a little bit also introduction about the IEEE uh, Young Professionals Kolkata section. Uh, just to uh, to give that, I'll just make a small presentation to you. Uh, I believe the screen is visible. 
Yes, sir, it is. It is. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just give, give a little bit brief profile about our IEEE Young Professional Kolkata section. Before even that, I'd like to speak about a little bit of uh, the IEEE uh, uh, group. The IEEE is basically what we know about the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Right. Uh, this is a very uh, well advanced. Uh, this is a group uh, whose main motive is to advance technology and mainly technology for uh, humanity, which, as the logo says it. Uh, giving a brief history was basically in 1884, uh, American Institute of Electrical Engineers was formed. Uh, then it was they were they were formed uh, by some uh, by some electrical professionals. And uh, their main motive was basically to spread the uh, spread the use of electric electric of uh, anything related with electrical uh, in the electrical professionals into uh, into the to the world of the humanity. However, during the during some time after this, in, the, in the one century, fifteen to 20, 10, 20 years back uh, later, after Marconi's experiments uh, related with wireless telegraphy, a new field came into it. That was what we see it to be as the wireless telegraphy. So in uh, following this, this, uh, this whole uh, market is due to this uh, wireless telegraph, due to this wireless telegraph, a new field emerged. And in 1912, the Institute of Radio Engineers at the IAD was also formed. But uh, uh, during 1963, during the 1960s, it was, it was found that uh, the memberships of IID was far exceeding the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. And, uh, but since both were a prominently engineering department, so what, they, what, in, uh, what happened was in 1963, the AI, AIEE and IRE, they formed to merge, they merged to form the Institute of Electrical in, in Electronics Engineers or the IEEE as what we know about. What do they actually basically offer? IEEE actually offers uh, the, to all its members uh, the uh, to basically uh, to uh, access uh, conferences, the access the journals in their website, uh, the different conferences, the money giving uh, um, giving reduction money uh, uh, money giving reduced uh, uh, to attend conferences or to uh, publish con publish papers in the conference at reduced prices. They uh, hold workshops and also they are involved in basically continued education to all the uh, uh, money, uh, money, through their journals and through their conferences conferences and workshops to give you continued education to everybody. This whole IEEE is basically broken up into 10 sections. The IEEE region, or rather we can see that in geographically they are divided into 10 regions. We fall under the region 10, that is uh, the Asia, the Australasia and the Asia Pacific. Uh, this part falls under the uh, region 10. That's where region uh, where the, this uh, uh, Indian Indian uh, the Indian subcontinent also falls under it. The IEEE can, you one can basically uh, participate in the IEEE uh, through their uh, student chapters. These are usually meant for the young students, for the undergraduate students, or even the undergraduate uh, under postgraduate students. They are mainly meant for postgraduate students and the undergraduate students. Uh, they have got societies. Uh, the IEEE societies, which are uh, mainly uh, focused with specific uh, domains, uh, that is the robotic societies they have got, they have got the laser societies, uh, they have got IEEE technical communities, they have, you have got, IEEE has got councils, and they have got special, uh, some special interest societies also. Uh, these are some of the societies you can actually see. So there is the aerospace and electronic societies, the antennas and propagation society. So everything, uh, everything which is related with basically uh, money, with which is related with uh, engineering, falls uh, as a part of this IEEE society. Under this IEEE society, IEEE society, the computer society. Uh, this was founded in uh, 1946. This is basically the leading organization of the computing professionals. And uh, they have basically some mid-career programs for the uh, professionals, like, like the, the Computer Society Certified Software Development Profession, that is CSDP, and also the CSDA. Uh, presently, the Compute, IEEE Computer Society uh, for Kolkata chapter, it's the chairperson is being held by, the chairperson is Dr. Shubhadi Basu, uh, the vice chairman chair, chairperson is Dr. Sharvani Roy, the secretary is Dr. Nivarun Dash, and the treasurer is Dr. Ram Shortkar. Uh, all of them presently faculties of Jadavpur University. 
now uh, coming to basically the IEEE young professionals. The IEEE young professionals is also a part of the IEEE and it's a, it's under it's under, it falls under the Computer Society chapter. Uh, it's it's an international community of enthusiastic and dynamic and innovative members. Uh, the affiliation with IEEE young professionals is open to all graduate students and higher grade members with early career interest. So anybody, so anybody who one, uh, if you are if you are a graduate, then one can easily become an IEEE young professionals uh, by be a part of IEEE young professionals. The IEEE Kolkata section. Uh, this is uh, the this is our mother body uh, under which our uh, the Computer Society and the IEEE young professionals falls under. This was mainly formed in 1971. Uh, the, this section has presently has 11 chapters, two affinity group, and almost like 15 student branches. Uh, the IEEE Young Professional Kolkata section, uh, this has got approximate, this was started in the 2000s under the, uh, under the bannership of what we, what was previously known as IEEE Gold. Uh, but it went a little bit cold at some time, and 19 to 2006, IEEE Gold was revived under Dr. Jamuna Khan Singh, who is presently the professor of Jadhapur University. In 2014, IEEE Gold was named as IEEE Young Professional. So, uh, the I, uh, initially, IEEE Gold was a part of was uh, uh, was a flagship for all undergraduate for all graduates, uh, which was renamed as IEEE Young Professionals, and. Uh, uh, the eligibility for eligibility for being a young professional is defined as a postgraduate post student memberships who are within 15 years of receiving their first professional degree with an option to participate beyond the 15 years plan. So if you are within the 15 years, uh, if you are a student, uh, if you are a graduate student uh, uh, with having a 15 years uh, with under the 15 years, so you can easily become the member of uh, IEEE Young Professionals. Presently, this young, uh, actively young professional Kolkata section, uh, the chairperson is myself, uh, Dr. Chintan Kumar Mandal. Vice chairperson is being held by Dr. Chandri Chaudhary, secretary Dr. Shomir Malakar, and the treasurer being the Dr. Shudhi Bhadikar. And that is all about uh, the IEEE, uh, uh, IEEE section. Uh, there are advantages, there are a lot of advantages, basically, if you become an IEEE member. Uh, that is, you can you get to have a lot of money. Since you are, some of you are going to be in the professional field. Uh, you have you gain to you gain to gain to have a, a huge network uh, following through this thing. Uh, sometimes it is very. Uh, sometimes it is. Uh, sometimes all of you think that being a uh, being a science graduate coming from a, a money. Since you are studying BSc in computer science. Or BSc, so you might be thinking, no, this is not one. We this this uh, this podium is not for us. Uh, this is quite wrong because at the end of the day, you should be, you should remember, be uh, without science, uh, technology doesn't move. So technology and science basically do they go hand in hand. So uh, even though you are uh, you have. Uh, uh, you have a degree. You have a degree in science, which we, which in India we do not say is a professional degree. But then, some, uh, but then uh, it does not, uh, but it does not, uh, uh, when I fall in the purview that you cannot become a member of IEEE. Being an IEEE member is something very prestigious. Okay. Uh, with this, I like to, th I like to thank you everybody for giving me this chance to, uh, to basically talk about uh, my uh, talk about IEEE, and. Uh, uh, I'd like to hand over uh, hand over this uh, uh, hand over this uh, podium right now, uh, uh, Ms. Shagodi Kachodri. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much, sir, for briefing us about IEEE Computer Society. Thank you so much. Um, also, I would like to thank from the Department of Computer Science to Dr. Shubhudeep Bashu, uh, Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, Jadavpur University and Chairperson IEEE Computer Society Kolkata section. Uh, moving on, just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the, during the webinar, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, it will be answered after our guest speaker finishes his lecture. Uh, so with that, now it is my pleasure to introduce the guest speaker for today. Our guest speaker today, Dr. Rajdeep Mukherjee, is an applied scientist at Amazon USA, where he is working in the machine learning team at Amazon Web Services. 
Prior to joining Amazon, Dr. Rajdeep worked as a principal software engineer in the Jasper R&D team at Cadence Design Systems USA. He has a PhD in computer science from University of Oxford. He completed his master's from IIT Kharagpur and BTech in computer science from Ashutosh, uh, sorry, BTech uh, in computer science from Calcutta University, Rajabajar Science College and BSc in computer science from Ashutosh College. His research interests are programming language, program analysis, software or hardware verification, satisfiability solvers, uh, automated reasoning for improving uh, software developers' productivity. So without further ado, let's give our guest speaker a round of virtual applause, Dr. Rajdeep Mukherjee, over to you, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. You are. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Shagarika, for the kind introduction. Um, so, um, so I'm not turning on my video, I'm a bit under the weather. Uh, so I got a bit of uh, fever and cough and cold. So I'm staying uh, without turning on my video. Hope that's okay. Um, okay, so um, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, joining this webinar. Um, um, I was listening to the previous uh, speakers and uh, um, all the uh, amazing uh, facilities that's available as as a, as a computer science student in uh, studying in Kolkata. Um, so I'm really grateful uh, to be present here today and and giving uh, sharing with you all uh, my experience and journey as a computer science student. Um, and also uh, taking this opportunity to uh, thank uh, all my previous mentors um, and collaborators with whom I worked in the past, and uh, uh, and that gave me the kind of platform uh, to explore more uh, in computer science, the, the work that I'm doing today. So I'm really grateful and honored to be part of this uh, webinar today. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for attending and taking this time uh, in the late evening uh, today. So really appreciate your presence. Um, so um, yeah, uh, as uh, you you all know, the title of the webinar it's uh, it's about automation. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, basically two things. Um, I mean, we all hear a lot about technical talks, uh, going deep into one particular topic. Uh, but since there are uh, so many students in the call, uh, so many young computer science aspirants, uh, computer science practitioner uh, in this in this uh, call today, uh, and uh, perhaps one hour or forty minutes on be a justice uh, on do a justice to my research <laughs> because there's so much uh, like deep things uh, that that needs more than a day or probably a week to explain. Uh, so um, I, I try to keep it short, uh, keep my uh, like uh, technical uh, things uh, short, uh, and try to more focus on uh, my journey and uh, share with you my experience, uh, like starting uh, from being a computer science student uh, to a computer science uh, to a computer scientist, uh, and hope that journey will uh, trigger a lot of uh, thought-provoking ideas in your mind, and you will. Uh, it will uh, have the. It will it will take take away something good uh, from this seminar today. Um, so let me let me share my screen uh, and and start talking about some of the some of the current work I'm doing. <clears throat> um, so. Um, is, is my presentation visible to everyone? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, great. So let me try the slide mode. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, the title of the talk is Automation is Everywhere Towards Building a Safe and Robust Software Paradigm. And as some of the earlier speakers have already uh, pointed to some buzzword uh, in this uh, title, the first is automation. And uh, 
uh, being a computer science uh, practitioner, I can tell you uh, that automation mm -hmm. is part of our everyday life, everyday journey, starting from waking up in the morning to going to sleep in the night. Uh, we are deeply, deeply involved with automation. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to show you some glimpses of how technology uh, evolves uh, and how technology becomes old every, uh, every three months or so. Uh, just because there are new uh, uh, notion of automation coming every day, uh, especially with the advent of uh, machine learning and deep learning technologies. Um, and uh, I'll give you my introduction um, and then I'll explain uh, how, what do I mean by building a safe and robust software paradigm. Uh, so essentially the talk will give you a glimpse of what a software is. Uh, so, uh, we will we define software as a vague term that's something which is a programming language or something which uh, which is a program but end of the day software is uh, industry right so we all agree that it's it's a huge industry which is moving uh, every part of the society and we as a computer science uh, student computer science practitioner has every uh, like uh, responsibility to to participate in that industry um, so currently I work as an applied scientist at Amazon and uh, this is my brief uh, background. Uh, so I started uh, from my undergrad, um, uh, Professor Gautam Mahapatra is here, so I was fortunate to be his student uh, at Ashutosh College, so that's where I began uh, studying computer science and uh, that's where I started uh, liking computer science. Um, so it all started from Ashutosh College um, and uh, starting with the BSc in computer science and then I went on to uh, uh, Raja Science College doing my uh, BTEC um, in computer science. Uh, so after uh, graduating from uh, Raja Vajra Science College, I uh, uh, joined IIT Kharagpur, uh, which where I did my MS in uh, computer science, but I worked on a thesis which is uh, which exposed me to a new domain in computer science which is called uh, formal verification i will explain briefly what formal verification is in the subsequent slides uh, and uh, my exposure uh, to the uh, research community started from uh, uh, like started from my undergrad days but it got more boosted when I went uh, to IIT Kharagpur for uh, my master's when I had to do a research thesis. Uh, and uh, as you might know, that research thesis involves research publication. Uh, so, uh, like, we have to write a thesis and we have to work on uh, new topics and uh, show something novel in that domain. And um, I was fortunate to be a part of a very dynamic uh, group at IIT Kharagpur working on uh, like formal verification, working with various industry partners in India and abroad, uh, and, and doing a very uh, theoretical as well as uh, practical uh, thesis at master's level. So while <clears throat> while working in uh, IIT Kharagpur, I uh, got really passionate about uh, formal verification. Uh, so you might uh, uh, formal verification, but just bear a moment. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly explain that in next slides. Uh, but I got exposed to formal verification, and that uh, that kind of inspired me to go forward with with this study for my PhD. Um, so I applied uh, to various universities uh, across the globe. Uh, <clears throat> I was looking for uh, the most renowned formal verification research group at that time, uh, around 2013. Um, and uh, uh, to my surprise, I got into one of the world's best uh, formal verification research group uh, in University of Oxford. <clears throat> so I went there for my PhD. Uh, I finished my uh, PhD studying there for five years. Uh, but uh, PhD is not only a degree. PhD is more than a degree. It, it transforms you as a, as a human being. It basically uh, creates a lot of uh, curiosity within yourself. Uh, so I don't consider PhD as kind of a degree or a stamp or a certificate, uh, but I consider PhD as something which uh, transforms me as a human and gives me more license and more responsibility to uh, work on behalf of the community. Um, so this is what Oxford taught me. 
that uh, to to give back uh, to to advance computer science in a way uh, that uh, like not only I benefit but also the society benefits. Uh, and uh, with that vision, I'm currently in the journey of like applying computer science in the industry, and hence benefiting millions of uh, customers for the industry. So um, if I look at the middle row, middle column here, uh, so. Uh, this was my academic experience, uh, but in my, I have a fair bit of industry experience um, as well. Uh, so I was fortunate to be part of uh, the <clears throat> uh, various research groups at Microsoft, at IBM, uh, during my PhD programs. Uh, so I joined Microsoft Research uh, as a PhD student where I did my uh, research internship. Uh, similarly, I joined IPM research in Switzerland where I stayed um, uh, for four months uh, doing a research internship on formal verification. And then after moving from academia, I moved to industry as a full-time uh, software professional. Uh, so I worked in Cadence Design Systems uh, where I used to build electronic design automation tools. Uh, and then uh, during my PhD, I also worked as a, in a startup called Deep Blue, which is a spin out from University of Oxford, which is uh, which was led by my own supervisor, Professor Daniel Croning. Um, so I, I was fortunate to be part of this startup and working as a startup is really, really challenging, but it teaches you a lot. Uh, so it was the Europe's most largest funded startup. Uh, at that time, uh, which was applying artificial artificial intelligence to software for, for coding. Um, and we were building some really cool technologies uh, working as part of Deep Blue. Uh, and then I moved on to uh, get some experience at ARM. So ARM is a processor manufacturer um, similar to Intel, but uh, they mostly work on uh, architecture instead of building their own processor. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I was part of the ARM research team for, for some time and worked at ARM as a, as a scientist. And currently I am uh, here at Amazon US uh, working in the cloud computing division, uh, again, doing program analysis, formal verification. So all of this work uh, and all of my past uh, like academic experience are mostly tuned towards working in one domain and but also extending my journey to like new domain where I can apply uh, this formal verification uh, as a technology. So uh, moving on. So um, I talked about formal verification, but uh, before going there, um, I want to talk about uh, uh, the most famous and most costly software bugs. Now I'll use the term software and bugs a lot in this uh, in this webinar. Uh, because as computer science student, we all uh, we all eat software, we all breathe software. Uh, it's it's everywhere. It's all around us. Uh, so, uh, uh, like, pardon me if I'm using too much uh, this term software, but that that's that's the that's the best, and we have to talk about it. So, um, uh, if you search for top and most famous costliest software bugs in the history in the last ten years, you will come across like uh, a list of software bugs that have shaken the industry, uh, not only financially, but also like damaging lives or taking human lives. Uh, and you will be surprised to see uh, the domains where uh, software is used. Uh, so the first one, the first major software bug, which uh, is listed in this slide, again, like this slide is nowhere exhausted. This is just to show you a glimpse of what software bug can do. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, just uh, these four bullet points here, uh, or the four bugs mentioned here, are just uh, the tip of the iceberg. So, there are a lot of other software bugs that have uh, changed human lives, the way we live, uh, have taken human lives as well. Uh, so, the first one is the Mars Climate Rover Orbiter. So, as you might all know, uh, folks who are interested in uh, extraterrestrial uh, space uh, that in December 1998, uh, there was a major software issue in the Mars Explorer. Uh, the From US NASA, we have sent a robotic probe to Mars to explore its climate and take photos of the Martian planet. Uh, now, what happened was in uh, September, after eight months of journey for this uh, uh, robotic space probe, uh, the orbiter disintegrated in the Martian atmosphere. 
uh, as it descended lower than the expected altitude. Now, when the uh, the ground station actually was trying to analyze the root cause of the failure, uh, they found that uh, uh, the ground station software was developed by a company called Lockheed Martin. So this is a company which creates software for uh, extraterrestrial like satellites uh, and 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 uh, sending like robotic probes to outside space. Uh, so this particular company created uh, results uh, in English units, which is the British unit, uh, instead of the metric unit as required by the NASA software. So Lockheed Martin, being a company, was following a British uh, uh, a British metric, which is followed in England which does not uh, coincide with the metric unit as followed by NASA software. And uh, as you might know that uh, in a company, when uh, engineers work together, oftentimes there is a need to agree on a specification. If, if people don't agree on a specification, disaster like this happens. Uh, and this particular disaster happened just because uh, the software engineers at Lockheed Martin uh, was, unit, uh, diff was using a different unit uh, for project software interface specification, which was different from the one which was used by NASA. And this uh, particular bug caused NASA to lose $125 million, uh, for, uh, which was used to build the orbiter. Uh, so this is one example where uh, a software bug can uh, cause a huge damage to the uh, exploration of outside space. Similarly, if we go to the next software bug, uh, it's the famous Intel Pentium processor bug. I guess all of you as a computer science student are aware that in 1994, a major bug was detected in Intel uh, Pentium processor, which is known as floating point division bug. Uh, and it was a bug in the operation module uh, where uh, a floating point decimal unit was used in the original Pentium processor. And uh, this error caused the processor to return uh, an incorrect binary floating point results uh, when dividing a number. Uh, of course, like this bug manifested like one in, let's say, 10 billion processor. But then again, this is a bug. And Intel had to recall all the Pentium uh, processor, which it manufactured and uh, uh, like shipped to the customer. And this, this is a software bug which was exposed in Intel's processor. Uh, and uh, according to the official report, this uh, poses a loss of $475 million. Uh, and the major reason was that there was a missing entry in the lookup table used by the floating point division. Now, as a computer science graduate, you all know what a lookup table is, how a floating point division algorithm works. So uh, be aware that such a bug happens in industry, which are actually functional industry. Like Intel is one of the best industry for making processor. But again, this kind of bugs actually creeps into the processor. And then Intel has to recall all the Intel, uh, like Pentium, uh, uh, processor because of this floating point division bug. So again, this is a major, major software issue, uh, which is reported uh, in Time magazine and all other places as one of the largest software bug that caused so much, so many million dollars to a company. Now, uh, moving on, uh, like uh, the next one is a bug triggered blackout. So oftentimes we see that uh, power grid failure, right? And there are a lot of projects in India and outside India where power grids are a major component where we, from where we get electricity. Now, we oftentimes hear that Chinese uh, or Russian have hacked some power grids in our country or elsewhere, and uh, these are all software hacks. Uh, and, and these are hacks because these power grid softwares are not robust, they are not built safely, and any intruder can hack this software to uh, to black out a particular region. Uh, let's say someone plans to just black out the whole eastern part of India. They can just do it with the software. Uh, and this was a major bug which got uh, exposed uh, uh, again in, uh, in 1900, uh, sometime in late 90s, uh, and eight United States and Canada region uh, like uh, were affected. So in a total, uh, 50 million people were affected because of this blackout. And this was because of a race condition. Now, some of you might already know what a date lock is because we all know what a date lock is, what a live log is from our operating system courses. Now, this is a situation where uh, you write a concurrent program where you use multiple threads, 
and uh, these multiple threads interact in a way such that one thread uh, writes uh, in the uh, like in the in the mutually exclusive space that the other thread has written into. So this creates a race condition bug. Uh, which was caused when two separate threads of a single operation use the same element of code. So, which means that the mutual exclusive property was not enforced correctly for two threads to operate simultaneously when uh, when performing a single operation used by the same element of code. And this lack of synchronization caused the threads to tangle and eventually crash the system. So you can imagine a software engineer writing this kind of code uh, can have impact on 50 million people which black out the entire region uh, across the United States and Canada. Uh, and this caused 256 power plants to go offline causing major dis disruption and widespread panic. Um, again, this just man goes on to say that uh, what kind of impact uh, a programmer, a software programmer has uh, today in, in our society uh, to ensure that writing safe and reliable software um, is, 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 is as important as building a bridge. Uh, uh, so this is just one example. And then there is another example, the fourth one, which is the glitch in the Patriot missiles. Uh, where a software error in the Patriot missile caused the lives of 28 uh, U.S. military personnel and additionally uh, injuring 100 plus U.S. military personnel. So this is a software bug which actually took a lot of lives. Uh, so there is no financial damage uh, for this particular bug, but there is uh, a damage to human life. Uh, and there are so many other cases where human life was lost uh, because, let's say, an erroneous software was be, uh, implemented in a Toyota car or in a Tesla car where uh, the car burned into flames or the car's uh, infotainment system weird behaviorly and it crashed into another car. Uh, so glitches like that happens. And uh, this particular glitch in Patriot missile happened uh, where uh, the American uh, soldiers were using this missile uh, to protect the American barracks from the uh, during the Gulf War, and the bug caused a delay in uh, tracking the missile real time rendering uh, the the American barracks defenseless to Iraqi attackers. Uh, so as you can imagine, this is a real time war situation where American soldiers use this software uh, implemented inside a missile to give uh, uh, to 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 save their armies and barracks, right? And uh, but the software did not work uh, as per the specification, and this software error in the Patriot missile caused uh, 28 American soldiers to die. Uh, the purpose for showing all these various use cases, starting from Mars Climate Orbiter to Intel Pentium to blackout for the power grid uh, uh, hacks or power grid failure to Patriot missile glitch, is just to show you that as a computer science student, uh, our job is not to study and, uh, uh, and and just learn by heart what a computer science or an operating system works or how a networking works. Works. It actually is to transform that knowledge into into practice and to make sure that we as a computer science a student or a graduate, whatever you are studying, masters, bachelors, PhD. Uh, you have a responsibility to contribute to this society because this society works on software, it breathes on software, and it will uh, develop more software each and every day and make more automation possible just by, uh, like, you know, brainstorming new ideas from students like you. Uh, so this is just just the start, and and uh, in the future, uh, like our society is running towards a, a situation where cars will be autonomous in the road, and in America we already see autonomous cars where humans are not driving the car, but a machine or a software is driving a car, and imagine uh, like that kind of power for a software to do image processing, to do like, you know, recognition at the real time, uh, to to uh, find out the terrain of the road. So many software components are integrated into these cars that it can automatically drive itself based on just few cameras and sensors that are attached to it. Uh, so the future is very interesting for computer science students. And I just uh, thought maybe this four uh, issues or software bugs uh, would trigger your mind and would allow you to think that we as a computer science student has every role to participate and, and, and make our future better so that human lives are not lost and, and, and so many million dollars are not wasted for companies.
Now, how do we do that? Uh, this is where my research comes into play. Uh, so we, uh, so I'm talking about the act of proving or disproving uh, correctness of an intended algorithm underlying a system with respect to certain formal property or specification. Now, this is uh, what formal verification is. This is different from uh, the conventional testing uh, that we all know, where we write a program, we test with few test cases, and then if those test cases pass, we say that the program is working correctly. If the test cases fail, then we fix the program, and then we run the test cases again. Formal verification is not testing. Formal verification is about proving the mathematical correctness of a software or, or of a system. Now, it either proves that a particular system uh, satisfies a property or it disproves that a system does not satisfy a property. Now, when it disproves that the system does not satisfy a property, it gives a, a, a counter example trace which shows that why a system does not satisfy a property. You don't have to write a single test case for your program. You just use a tool uh, which is this automated formal verification tools, and you can write programming like any programming language, C, C++, Java. You can write hardware languages like Verilog, VHDL, and you can write a specification, uh, uh, which are which you can imagine if you are expert in C language, then you can imagine writing assertion, because C support assert.h. So you can write assertion in your program, and imagine you are writing a program for uh, finding GCD of two numbers, right? And you want uh, a particular thing to be greater than zero. So you write an assertion that some number has to be greater than zero after the GCD is computed. Uh, and you throw that specification and the program for computing the GCD, uh, which is the program for computing the greatest common divisor, to this tool, uh, which is a formal verification tool. And then it mathematically proves the correctness that the GCD algorithm or let's say a Fibonacci algorithm, whatever algorithm you have written or implemented satisfies your specification, right? And the specification in this case could be a simple assertion in your code. Now, specification can be very complex as well. Like you can write specification in, uh, in several other languages called linear temporal logic, which is introducing a notion of time uh, because oftentimes you can imagine uh, in finite state machine, or in automaton, we have state transitions. So we, we can specify things like if A happens, then after two clock cycle, B happens, right? So if you want to specify properties like this, we use a, a language called linear temporal logic, which was invented by Dr. Amid Noeli, a famous Israeli scientist who has got, uh, uh, who has got Turing Award <coughs> for for, uh, for introducing this uh, LTL, linear temporal logic. So uh, this is the, the, the kind of specification property that we write to verify a program. And uh, the other part of formal verification is, now you can ask a question that, what do you mean by proving using formal methods of mathematics? Uh, now, this is an interesting question where, uh, given a program and given a specification or a property, how do you use mathematics or logic to verify that the specification is actually an over approximation of the program. That is, the program satisfies the specification. Now, in order to do that, we use propositional logic and satisfiability solvers. Uh, so I'll go into more details about uh, those things in the next next few slides. But before going into that uh, detail about like uh, how a formal verification tool works in practice, let me tell you a few uh, actual practitioners from industry which uses formal verification today. Now, as you can see here, there are like tons of industry names given here and the list goes on and on. And I could not uh, like uh, write all the names here. But major companies which are investing heavily in formal verification today are Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Uber, um, uh, IBM, uh, Netflix, NVIDIA, ARM, Samsung, Apple, Intel. Every single company in the, R in, in the world today are using formal verification technology for shipping their software, their hardware, and uh, anything that they develop today. Because without guaranteeing that the, that the product meets the specification, there is no shipping of that product. And testing cannot guarantee uh, mathematical correctness. Testing can only say that I can 
verify your design up to a certain extent, but it cannot provide mathematical guarantees for verifying your design. Um, and uh, industries today are employing heavily um, on, on this technology because as the first slide shows that any single bug in a software or a hardware can take can can be a loss of millions of dollars as well as be very severe, which can take human lives as well. So companies are very serious about this technology today. Now, there are a few taxonomy of verification. Um, uh, so we start off with a concept, which is basically, let's say, an English specification. So uh, I, can, I can come up with an idea and say that, look, I want to design an elevator which works with this given specification, the elevator system, right? Now, this is an English specification, which is written in an English language. But how do we translate that, that English language into a mathematical property? Now that's done with this language called linear temporal logic or computational temporal logic uh, to specify that how this elevator system will work. Uh, and once that formalization happens, then someone, some designer or some software engineer actually builds that elevator system, right? Which is in software, which when you press certain uh, key in your elevator system, it just takes you to a certain floor. And then when someone else prays, then it just queues up request in that stack. Uh, and then it performs its operation based on the way the request is being made, right? So there is certain algorithm that works behind the scene for an elevator to run. And someone who has implemented this elevator system wants to know that how the design of the elevator system if that meets the specification or not and this is where uh, the the technology of formal verification is used where starting from a concept we design a specification and in this particular diagram you can show this is shown uh, in the hardware where you start off with a concept you uh, you conceptualize that into a mathematical specification and then the designer actually comes up with a design so in this case instead of a software someone has written a VHDL, which is a hardware equivalent of a software. This is a hardware language, which is called VHDL, which HDL stands for uh, Hardware Descriptive Language. So this is similar to C, C++, but in hardware. And then one can formulate, uh, synthesize a transistor level operation from the VHDL. And then the final silicon for the ele elevator system is being built, right? Now, at every step of this, uh, of this uh, process, one can apply formal verification. So just to make sure that we all are in the same page, let's say we and we apply formal verification between this, between the specification and the VHDL design here. Now, in the second phase, we apply again a, a tool which takes a VHDL design and a transistor design, which are synthesized from the VHDL and check their equivalence. Now, checking equivalence is same as checking, uh, doing a formal verification on the design. And once the transistor is being built, we uh, we synthesize a silicon design out of it. Now, an equivalence checker can also work at this level, which takes this to input and then checks whether the transistor is indeed same as the silicon level design before the tape out happens, right? So this is a flow which is followed in the hardware industry as well as in the software industry, where at every given level, when a design is being made and when a specification is being uh, created, one apply formal verification tool at each of these levels to verify that the designs are equivalent and does not uh, diverge from the original specification. Now, moving forward, um, um, so let me skip this slide. Uh, I'll straight away go to this slide. So here is one, uh, uh, one property. Uh, let's say someone builds a design like this, uh, which is a finite state machine. And I guess you all are aware of what a finite state machine is. Uh, now, um, it automatically calculates truth or falsity of specification by traversing the state space. Now, let's say the specification is something like if a request is received, it will be processed within three clock cycles. And the underlying FSM is something like this. Now, when a request is received, like, is this automaton guaranteeing that it will be <coughs> sorry, it will be processed within uh, three clock cycles? Now, who will check this design? Because there are a lot of other uh, uh, transitions that are happening between these uh, these uh, uh, individual nodes uh, or states, and uh, this is the entire design, and this is one specification for that design. 
Now, this specification is being translated to a LTL, which is a linear temporal logic, and this design is formulated as a uh, as a binary formula, which is a propositional logic, which is in propositional logic, and the propositional logic encodes the state transition for this automaton here. Now, given the propositional logic encoding of the state transition for this automaton and the LTL property, which is here uh, for this particular uh, specification, we use uh, the underlying state space explosion algorithm to understand whether any particular transition in this automaton can dissatisfy or violate the specification which is given over here. That is to say that if we see that if a request is received, uh, it is processed in more than three clock cycles, then we get a counterexample trace, which violates this particular design, right? So formal verification both proves as well as disproves a particular property. And it is very good at disproving because we can propose this specification as a negation where we can say that this is the original specification. We negate it. Negation means adding a, a counter logic or uh, adding a not in front of the specification and asking the underlying uh, solvers, which are this propositional satisfiability solvers, this question that give me a counterexample trace for this design where this, if a request is received, it is not processed within three clock cycles. So for a SAT solver or a satisfiability solver, it is very easy to find a counterexample trace where it does not satisfy the specification rather than to prove the property. Because in order to prove the property, you have to exhaustively, uh, you have to exhaustively follow every transition and there are loops as well. So you have to reach a fixed point, uh, which is a fixed point computation of the fixed point algorithm, which means that you reach a stable state. Right, so a SAT solver is very good at finding counterexample traces, which is to say that if this does not satisfy this design, then it will come up with the trace starting from this uh, node four here or, or this node zero here. And when a request is received, it will exactly show you which state violate this specification over here. Right, so uh, I'll show you probably uh, some of the ways in which the SAT solver works, but before going that, uh, uh, we all know about what a simulation is. Now, covering the design space with simulation would look something like this, where you have these small dots over here, and the error state is in red over here. So if you have a design, which is this whole circle here, so imagine you have a state space to compute, and these blue dots are the ones which are actual uh, simulated behavior of the design, and the red state is the error state. Now, with simulation, let's say you write a bunch of test cases for your design but you only simulate these blue dots here. You never touch the error state because you, as, a, as a tester, you have no idea where the error is. So through simulation, you may have a chance to miss a bug, which is this red state here. But what a formal verification guarantees is that you do not have to explicitly write simulation test cases to probe your design, but rather you transform this design into a mathematical formula. You transform your specification into a mathematical formula. You throw that too as a conjunction to an underlying satisfiability solver. And then you ask this question to the SAT solver say, saying that, hey, give me a set of traces which violate this particular design. So in a sense, mathematically, you are proving the whole state space of the design which is this whole bold, uh, which is marked in bold uh, blue here. So this is the guarantee which the formal verification provides. Now, there is another notion of formal verification where we can uh, use assumptions or we can restrict the search space that we want to explore to be into certain condition. So going back to the GCD example, the greatest common divisor example, say, say I want to compute the GCD of two numbers, and I tell you that both the numbers has to be greater than 10. Now, if this is a specification, then I put an assumption to my formal verification tool saying that uh, the design should hold the property only when the numbers are positive integers and greater than 10. Now, in such cases, of course, you are not exhaustively traversing the whole state space, but you are only traversing or proving the correctness for a part of the design. And this is a very common practice in industry because of scalability reasons, because SAT solver today are very good in handling, handling hundreds of millions of propositional variables. Uh, but uh, for large designs, let's say you are verifying the, uh, the chip of the entire iPhone, 
right? Now, you, you can imagine the CPU of an iPhone will have billions of states because underlying there are billions of transistors used uh, because these are like each iPhone or each Samsung phones are like uh, are supercomputers, right? So there are billions of transistors. So uh, underlying your formal verification tool is exploring billions of state spaces. Uh, and the SAT solver, which is the satisfiability solver, which does the heavy work, uh, may not be able to solve every formula. So in order to constrain your search space, uh, we can specify assumptions like this to uh, to explain that why certain uh, part of the design I'm interested to explore and, and I may leave out a bug like this. So moving forward, um, uh, so let me, um, Okay, let me ask about the time if I'm doing uh, right on time. Uh, uh, Shagarika, is uh, like, is the time okay? Um, yeah, are we yeah. running on time? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, it's fine, sir. It's fine. You can proceed. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, just a sec. So my screen is still visible, right? Yes, sir, yes. it is. It is. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, perfect. So um, let me show you some uh, real example for uh, uh, for uh, bounded model checking. So, um, so I, I spoke some uh, a little bit uh, bits and pieces about uh, verifying a hardware design or uh, or a, or a state machine. Now. How about uh, verifying a software? So this is uh, this is our Oxford homepage, uh, the group where I worked uh, during my PhD. And uh, uh, as uh, as a formal verification PhD student, we used to build uh, uh, tools uh, for both software as well as hardware verification. Uh, so I encourage every one of you uh, to visit this particular page. I can put that in the uh, in the chat here. Um, so if you, any of you are interested in uh, doing uh, formal verification for your C program or C++ program um, or, or maybe learn about, you know, how this uh, SAT solver works, how a satisfiability solver uh, uh, handles a propositional formula and uh, returns back a satisfying assignment for a propositional formula. Now, again, this is like NP-complete problem, right? So uh, this is like a, a lot of heuristics are used uh, to... Uh, to kind of uh, uh, come to a solution for a satisfiability solver when the number of variables for a satisfiability solver is too large to handle. Um, and uh, this particular tool that we have built in Oxford uh, is, is kind of a great example for uh, undergrad students and master students to, uh, to start playing around with formal verification tools. Uh, so this tool is called CBMC, which is a, a, a bounded model checker. BMC stands for bounded model checking, and C stands for, for C programs. Uh, but it also supports C++ programs. So, um, and this is done in collaboration with Edmund Clark. Uh, some of you might know the name of Edmund Clark, who is, uh, who is a Turing awardee. So Edmund Clark was uh, the supervisor of my supervisor. Uh, in Oxford, so he, he he is kind of a pioneer in uh, in formal verification and bounded model checking, and he received his Turing Award for bounded model checking. Um, so uh, yeah, Turing Award is kind of a Nobel for computer science. Um, so anyone who gets Turing Award is is kind of hugely recognized and and becomes a pioneer in the field. Uh, so this entire uh, group that we used to work works very closely with Edmund Clark and, and his team uh, at Carnegie Mellon University in CMU uh, in the US and Oxford used to collaborate with them. Uh, so uh, just to give you some pointers, uh, this is uh, the, the CBMC tool which can be installed and uh, for Windows, for Linux, for Mac operating system. So um, I would heavily encourage each one of you to uh, download this tool uh, learn, write a simple C program and just run this tool. The documentation is very exhaustive. You'll be able to easily understand how to install, how to run, and just play around because, you know, uh, we, we we often talk about search space, right? And search space is a very fundamental problem in computer science. Even Google uh, uses uh, search, right? And uh, building an algorithm which does search space exploration 
is fundamental for us as a computer scientist, right? So, uh, and, and this is a tool which does that for you. Uh, so, and the source code, a good thing is that this is on, not only the binary are present, but the source code is available. So you can get the entire C++ source code uh, right from uh, this link here. And you can take a look at how a professional software is being designed uh, and, and, and how people use this uh, software for uh, doing uh, bounded model checking. Now, if you are a Java programmer uh, who are interested in Java, there is this tool called JBMC, which uh, uses uh, the Java bytecode. So uh, this is a bounded model checker for Java programs. Uh, so it can check runtime exceptions. It can check user-defined assertions. Uh, which I was telling you. So as a Java programmer, you can write assertion in your program. So uh, if you write assertions and if you write a program, it will simply check that uh, whether your program satisfies uh, the assertion. So just an example for uh, a simple Java program and the corresponding assertion is, so let's say you have a package and then you define a class here um, and you write a main function and then you write, declare a string. Now, this is the string S and this is the string U. Um, let me uh, maybe make the screen a bit bigger. Um, so, uh, and now there is an assertion which basically is checking if S dot contains U and there is a not in front of it, right? Now, this assertion failure is found by JBMC. Now, S dot contains U. So, it's asking whether the string S contains the string U, right? Uh, and there, there is an assertion in the program. Now, if you... Uh, specify such a program and you write an assertion like this embedded into the program, then all you have to do is to basically write Java C, which is the Java compiler, and then provide your Java Java code. And then you can write, you can, then it will basically extract uh, the class file, right? It will create the class file. And on the class file, you can write, you can uh, run the JBMC tool, which is the tool made by Oxford, uh, and simply get whether uh, this particular assertion is being uh, satisfied by the program or if it fails by this program. Uh, so there are a bunch of other uh, uh, command line arguments, like how many times you want to unwind, what is the class part, where the class path is stored, you have to specify the jar file. Uh, but these are pretty easy stuff. If you are a Java programmer, you are very much acquainted with how a jar file is being built, and 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 you will have no problem running this uh, JBMC tool on your Java design. Um, so I would heavily encourage you, like even if you do not write or do not work on formal verification, but at the end of your undergrad, you all do uh, software projects, right? Uh, so when you do your project, however little program you are you are writing or implementing for your project, make sure you write enough test cases, but at the same time, make sure you use a mathematical tool to verify the correctness of your program, because that's very important. It's not only to use the tool, but also it will open up your mind to a lot of other questions that how this tool is even working behind the scene to verify my program. And uh, this is a fascinating, uh, like, you know, branch of computer science, uh, which uh, which basically emphasizes a lot on safety and reliability of writing programs. Uh, and uh, uh, any software project you are working on, make sure uh, instead of doing testing or apart from doing testing, also run this tool for your C++ program, for your Java program, for C program, whatever language you are using, uh, make a habit of using this kind of tools for ensuring that your software doesn't crash uh, when it's uh, it's it's uh, when it's not supposed to crash. So um, this is uh, I just wanted to share uh, with you guys about this particular uh, resources uh, from our Oxford group, um, and uh, there are a bunch of other publications I'm not going into now. Uh, but if anyone is interested in hardware verification, for example, instead of verifying your C, C++, you want to verify a Verilog program or a system Verilog program or a system C program, right, which are, which are hardware uh, models. You can use uh, tools called vSeeger or EBMC, or for system C, you can use a tool called Scoot. Uh, and these are all tools which were built in Oxford. Like these are in-house tools which are built by PhD students. Uh, and I was one of them to work on, on these tools there back at that time. And uh, you can pretty much see that uh, uh, the emphasis for the PhD was not only theoretical research, but also how you transform the algorithm that you actually mention in pen and paper into a tool like this. And these tools are open source. So you can, you can look at the source code 
and you can uh, study like uh, how a professional software is being uh, is being designed. Um, okay, so going back uh, to giving you some notion of um, uh, of a satisfiability solver. So I promised you that I'll show you uh, how a sad solver looks like. So um, let me start off with a with a very small program. I'll uh, probably do it very fast. Um, um, okay. So this is uh, this is what um, let me extend my screen. Okay. So um, so this is how a CBMC tool operates, right? A bounded model checking tool would operate. So we start off with a C++ source code. We have a parser which generates the parse tree. And then we build our intermediate representation, which is called a control flow graph, CFG. Uh, you all have studied compiler. Uh, maybe you'll study in your, uh, in your third year or so. Um, but uh, the intermediate representation is one of the fundamental representation for any analysis tool. So starting from your source code, um, in whatever language you are using, C++, Java, Every source code comes with an associated parser, which is used for parsing that language. And once you parse that language, the parse tree is generated. And the, from the parse tree, there are standard algorithms to construct a control data flow graph, which is the CFG. And this constitutes the front end. Now, given a program like this, uh, let's say uh, there is an if statement, there are a bunch of switch cases, and then there is a default SR0. Um, I can draw a control flow graph like this. Right, so if 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 t is uh, greater than zero, uh, greater than or equal to zero, and less than or equal to seventy nine, then there is a switch statement, then a bunch of case case statements, and then it ends in the default statement. So this is the control flow graph for a program like this. Uh, and how do I transform this control flow graph into a SAT solver, which is thrown to a satisfiability solver? So, which is the the question here is how do I transform this graph into a formula? Right, because end of the day, I have to trans, uh, uh, hand over this graph to a SAT solver to 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 tell me whether this assert zero is being reached or not. Right, so in order to do that, let's say I uh, I, I I encode a formula like this, which traverses this particular path, the one which is marked in red. So if you go from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and then you take this switch uh, case statement, and then you go to the end of this uh, switch case statement. Now, the formula that encodes this particular branch is given like this, right? Uh, this is the formula, and, and again, this transformation from the graph to this formula, again, happens with the standard algorithm. Uh, I'm not going into the algorithm, but I'm just uh, showing you the output of what this transformation would look like. So this graph transforms into a formula like this. And now once this formula is obtained, uh, we ask the underlying SAT solver. So this SAT solver is uh, termed as decision procedure here. Uh, so decision procedure is a fancy name uh, for a SAT solver because it uses a lot of uh, uh, underlying theories like theory of arithmetic, theory of linear algebra, uh, theory of octagons, and so on uh, to 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 uh, do or to satisfy a particular uh, formula. So in this case, since t is an integer, uh, which uh, uh, which happens to be bounded between zero and seventy nine, so it uses theory of integers to uh, to to satisfy this formula, uh, to to find a satisfying assignment for this formula. So if you throw this formula to a SAT solver, it comes back and says that uh, if t is 21 and b is 0 and c is 0 uh, and, 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 and then the rest of the assignments are here, then I can reach that particular assert statement, right? So the SAT solver has found a satisfying assignment uh, to this formula. And this is the value of any inputs on the path, which basically says that I have found a satisfying assignment which takes me from here to this state where the assert 0 was placed. Right, and assert zero means always fail, right? Assert zero. So if you write assert zero for any program, it will always fail. But the question here is that: is there a path in this program that can reach this failure state, right? So this is exactly what this encoding is showing: that if I take this branch and throw it to a SAT solver, it's giving me a satisfying assignment, which means that this assert statement, assert zero statement, is reached from the input point of the program. Right? And this is one such satisfying assignment. There can be other satisfying assignment that the SAT solver can throw, but 
for the purpose of demonstration, uh, this is one satisfying assignment that uh, the SAT solver has returned. Now, there are many SAT solvers that are built in the past, and my own PhD uh, research was on developing a new kind of SAT solver uh, using uh, higher dimension domains like octagons and polyhedra. Uh, uh, but there are a lot of propositional solvers uh, which are open source. Uh, and you can also play around with SAT solvers where you can just simply throw a Boolean formula or a formula with uh, nonlinear arithmetic or linear arithmetic, and it comes back with a solution. Right, and uh, I, you all are aware of uh, like uh, ILP problems, right? Integer linear problems. Now the same ILP solvers uh, technology that the ILP solver uses uh, is being used by the SAT solver as well, but with the theory of linear arithmetic. Right. So whatever we do in pen and paper, uh, we are trying to solve an ILP formula. We can do that same thing with uh, with the corresponding ILP solver. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so these are these are few examples of uh, of the SAT solver, which are very commercial, uh, and these are used uh, widely across the industry. So Z3 from Microsoft is uh, one of the very popular uh, SMT solver, which is satisfiability modulo theory solver, because it uses a lot of underlying theory like bit vectors, arithmetic, linear arithmetic, and so on. And I would heavily encourage all of you to uh, to also study uh, this this uh, this underlying SMT solvers, right? How how if you are interested in uh, like intersection of computer science and propositional logic and how a first order logic works. Uh, then, like, just open the box, open the source code of this uh, satisfiability solvers, and just try to understand how the search algorithms are used here, right? So this talk is not sufficient to go into the details of each of these, but these are fascinating technologies that are built over the years. And just to show you a glimpse of, we started the SAT solver in 1960s, right? Um, because it's uh, the number of variables we could have solved in 1960s is is less than 100, right? So which means to say that a propositional formula with less than 100 variables would have a solution in the year 1960s. But over the time, scientists and the research community, uh, especially the SAT solving research community, have explicitly made a huge attempt to boost the power of SAT solvers. Because as you have already seen, the core of any formal verification technology is a SAT solver because this is kind of the brainchild of any formal verification tool. So if the SAT solver cannot solve more than 100,000 or 1 million variables, then the software or the hardware with billions of uh, state spaces that we are trying to solve today uh, will not scale. So we have to first scale the SAT solving technology and then only the whole industry of formal verification can scale uh, just because we can now support uh, millions of variables for SAT solving. So in 2010, we, we have solved uh, 1 million variables uh, with propositional formula having 1 million variables using SAT solving technology. But today with machine learning and a lot of like parallelization across multiple machines, uh, we are able to solve more than 5 million variables uh, in a given design with the SAT solver. And uh, if you guys are not aware, uh, there are active competition in the software verification community, uh, which are called SVComp, which is uh, the competition for uh, submitting your own tool based on the SAT solvers every year uh, it happens. And any university student can participate in those competition and, and, and contribute uh, either to the design or to uh, or to like, you know, this kind, this kind of SAT, new kind of technology for the SAT solvers. And we from Oxford were heavily participating in our year on year challenge for submitting a new version of the tool every year so as to win the competition. Uh, so uh, this this uh, this entire ecosystem of uh, like you know f software enthusiasts and SAT solving enthusiasts and formal verification enthusiasts this is very dynamic and very vibrant and uh, I would encourage each one of you to even participate in these competitions uh, such as SVComp or SATComp these are the name of the competitions so that you can get exposed to these technologies very early on in your career. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, so this uh, sad solving is an enabling technology uh, and it has made enormous progress in the last 10 years. And kudos to uh, the Turing awardee, um, uh, Professor Edmund Clark and his team uh, who has made a huge fundamental shift to, to, to scale the SaaS solver in the last 10 years. And industries like Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon are all benefiting from the work that academics have done in the last 10 years in the SaaS solving. Um, so I'm, I'm not going into the details of, uh, of, 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 of this, uh, but I'll, I'll share the slides uh, after, after the talk. Uh, but all the resources for uh, like uh, the, what I've explained so far, uh, everything is open source. So if you guys are interested, uh, the tools are available, uh, the source code are available, uh, just uh, download and just play around with this. Uh, uh, and that would be my message uh, uh, taking uh, from this uh, from this demonstration here. Um, so probably I'll spend a few more words on uh, my current work on Amazon uh, very briefly, um, and then I'll open up uh, for Q and A. Um, so this is my current work uh, that I'll quickly uh, go through. So currently I'm working on for applying formal verification in cloud. Uh, so I'm working in cloud computing division in Amazon Web Services, uh, where we are building a very cool uh, technology uh, for helping software developers uh, write better code. Uh, and what do I mean by that is uh, uh, cloud is everywhere, right? Uh, I mean, similar to automation is everywhere. Uh, cloud is starting to become uh, the, the fundamental nature of computing. Uh, so if you look at the global market for uh, IT, uh, it's roughly around $1.9 trillion, right? Uh, but only 5% of that is in cloud today. Uh, so, but industries are moving to cloud uh, faster than ever before. Uh, and we all benefit from uh, from having cloud as, as kind of our storage, our database, our machine learning services. Um, and in the US, uh, there are several vendors who are providing cloud services, starting from Google Cloud to Amazon AWS uh, to Microsoft Azure Cloud to Oracle's Cloud to IBM Cloud and so on. Uh, and almost entire startup ecosystem in the US has moved to cloud today. Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, you, we all have subscription of Netflix, right? And uh, Netflix, uh, the entire Netflix host, uh, the ways the movies are streamed, the way the database is being used, it's done on AWS cloud. So Netflix as a company doesn't have any single machine apart from their logging machine to AWS uh, because they don't have any database, they don't have any storage, they don't have any streaming capability. Every single thing is hosted in Amazon Web Services Cloud. So this goes on to show you that uh, if you're building a new startup and if you're investing in uh, like building a new technology, like traditional wisdom was that we will have to buy, let's say 50 machines, or we'll have to build a server rack. We'll have to maintain the server in some desert places, right? Everything is obsolete now. Like we don't have to buy any machine. We just uh, use the cloud. It's pay as you go. So it's it's basically, you pay uh, the, 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 the time for which you use the cloud. Uh, and, and it's super uh, like friendly to kind of log in and, and get your resources uh, into the cloud. Uh, so all this comes with a cost, right? Uh, and security is one of the major concern in the cloud. Uh, and we as formal verification practitioners uh, are important to play this role of guaranteeing that our customers like Netflix, uh, and, and there are so many other customers like Boeing, which develops spacecraft, which also uses AWS cloud, they all benefit from, uh, from this cloud security. Uh, so we built this formal verification technology for uh, folks who wants to migrate to cloud. Uh, so big companies who host their uh, softwares who uses our service, cloud services. And explicitly, I work on a service called Amazon CodeGuru, uh, which is basically a static analysis or a formal verification tool uh, to find bugs in Java programs, uh, in uh, JavaScript programs, in uh, Python programs and so on. Um, so uh, previously, I don't know how, how many of you are aware of uh, CI/CD or continuous integration, continuous development lifecycle of a software, uh, but oftentimes if you use a GitHub 
like repository for hosting your software um, and you associate your repository with a static analysis or formal verification tool, you tend to get a recommendation on your code, right? So uh, so the, the, the concept in the industry is that if you write a code, before you check in your code uh, in GitHub, uh, a, 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 a peer software engineer will review your code. Uh, and until and unless the review of your code is done, you cannot check in your code, right? Because there has to be some uh, checks and balances in the system. Otherwise, everyone will push their buggy code. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to replace this human reviewer in the loop. So we are trying to automate this entire review process that a human, instead of a human reviewing your code, how about a machine reviewing your code and trying to put some recommendation on your code? Right. So here is a small example which shows that this is a hello world function app dot Java, and this is a GitHub code snippet. Uh, so the client is trying to use the Amazon DynamoDB client builder, which is an Amazon AWS service uh, DynamoDB, which is a database service, and they are trying to do something bad here. Right. And this bad thing is being commented by our automatic uh, under the hood analyzer which is basically saying that this code is written so that the client cannot be reused across invocation of Lambda functions, right? And this is one example where a human, instead of a human writing such a command, because a human can also be error prone. A uh, human uh, may not know that this is a buggy thing in the code because a human may be as good as an in, uh, engineer as you are. So how do you ensure that a system automatically understands your code and then tries to come up with a recommendation on your code? So we are building this recommendation service, which is called Amazon Code Guru, which takes in uh, the code which are hosted in uh, this repository system like Bitbucket or GitHub and try to post comments on your code, human having to review your code. And this is a transformational technology uh, which is happening in the cloud. And this goes on to show that our customers uh, are fully aware of consequences of hosting their data in the cloud. And we from AWS gives them the peace of mind to host their data by providing services like this, where we completely remove, remove the human in the loop and automate this technology to 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 kind of so that uh, the developers in uh, that is our customers are aware of the bugs in their code. So I'm currently working on this technology. There's a huge team in AWS, a lot of amazing scientists uh, from uh, from different universities in the US. Uh, where we where we try to uh, like apply machine learning and program analysis, conventional program analysis, uh, to automate uh, the 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 uh, the review job that a human would do, uh, so that we can do a much better job using automation uh, for finding security bugs uh, to finding functional bugs such as uh, violating crypto library best practices or violating AWS API security best practices, uh, bugs like uh, secure web applications, uh, like uh, like injection bugs, cross-site scripting. These are very dangerous bugs which happens uh, when uh, our customers use cloud services uh, to, to, to check in their code and, uh, and access the database services in the cloud. Uh, also, bugs like sensitive information leak, where information uh, logging of credit card numbers and such things can happen in the customer code. So our tool automatically runs uh, under the hood and uh, gives warning to the customer about those kind of uh, bugs in their code. Uh, okay, so this concludes uh, my um, kind of technical, uh, I, I know I have been very hand wavy throughout the uh, talk, but I had to cover so much. Uh, so many technologies, and uh, but I wanted to get like get across uh, this message, uh, like uh, as my last slide uh, to all of you. Um, uh, and and this is my earnest request. I mean, this is not to show the 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 the, the breadth and uh, depth of the knowledge I have gathered over the years, but this is just to show you that uh, starting from undergrad uh, to to reaching here. Um, it, it, it has been a very hard effort uh, on my part, but uh, it, it has been a very rewarding effort uh, because I followed this few principles that I have listed in this slide. Um, and uh, I, I, I honestly request uh, all, of, all of you bright talents uh, out there to kind of like follow this uh, call for action um, uh, because we ha all have the responsibility to 
make the world a better place. Being a computer science, we are privileged to study computer science. And if you trust me, uh, this is one of the most fascinating subject uh, uh, like uh, that 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 ever happened, and that's going to sustain for forever. Uh, even if we build uh, like an outer space world, which Elon Musk uh, often tells, but uh, anywhere we go, if you go on Mars, if you stay on Earth, uh, the 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 use of software is going to uh, transform our lives. And we as computer science student has to follow some simple actions which I listed in this uh, in this presentation, uh, which is to write code every day. So don't go to sleep without writing code uh, because we because otherwise computer science is 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 invalid without writing code, right? However much good theoretical uh, computer science uh, knowledge you have, uh, if you're not writing code, uh, you cannot ca call yourself a computer science practitioner. So, so write code, uh, break things fast, uh, because uh, if you break things, then only you learn things. And uh, I have shown you all the success stories of uh, in my presentation so far, but behind every success stories, there are so many failures. Uh, like, and I cannot enumerate the number of failures I had in my in, in my academic and professional life so far. And each of these failures have taught me more than what the success have taught me. So don't don't be afraid to fail. Um, that that's very important because as a budding uh, scientist or a budding uh, computer science student, like uh, like fail uh, fail uh, like do something. And 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 don't be afraid to fail because it's it's very important that you learn from your mistakes, and it's 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 okay to make mistakes. That that's my core uh, core message here. Also, think logically because computer science is logic. It's it's not it's not history. It's not it's not English. It's it's all about logic. So if you think logically, um, uh, you have got like tremendous faculties in your colleges, um, and uh, and and I'm sure like this logical thinking will take you a long long way in your career. Um, and 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 try to learn and be curious always. Don't don't get satisfied with with answers from your faculties. Like try to push your faculties uh, uh, because uh, like even if you push me on my own topic, I, I I can stumble like fumble in or or I can I can fail sometime to answer your question. And it's okay to fail uh, to answer your question. But but be curious. I mean try to try to like you know not fall into the status quo of like. Uh, they know better than me. Like, try to break things. Try to be curious. Try to like question each and every things that you see around you, um, so that you learn your through curiosity. Uh, and and that's my core message here. And and uh, always feel like you know there is no, no such thing that you can cannot like work on research paper from your undergrad or masters. Uh, try to re read research papers from early on in your career. Um, and that's very important. Uh, either you go to research or not, it doesn't matter, but try to get yourself acquainted with books, uh, not through internet websites, uh, but through books, uh, through tools, uh, the tools that I have shown you today. Uh, there are so many other tools for for whoever is interested in machine learning. There are other tools in machine learning. There are tools in image processing. Try to get use uh, of these tools because people are doing amazing work, and you should, you all should embrace uh, the work that other universities students and professors are doing. So get yourself acquainted with the uh, with the subject of your interest. My subject of interest ha has been formal verification, and I have been pushing uh, myself to uh, learn more and more in this domain for the last ten years almost now, and and there's still so much to learn. Uh, so whatever domain uh, of your choice is, uh, try to read research paper, try to play around with tools uh, to, from top universities uh, and, and see uh, where your knowledge lacks. Try to develop on those aspects. Um, and uh, the other thing is like uh, there is no such domain that does not use software. Uh, so uh, software is used from bank to Tesla to Power Grid. Uh, the example that you have seen, seen in the first slide, right? So, uh, and as a computer science student, uh, like uh, there are more jobs in computer science than you can imagine. Um, so, like just think yeah. about flying high and and and, <laughs> and and try to try to make it big. Um, so these are all uh, I had to say. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, this is my website. This is my email ID. Please feel free to uh, to reach out to me uh, with any questions. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try my best to accommodate uh, like any questions that you have regarding your choice of uh, subject, PhD, uh, career choices, and so on. Um, and and I'm grateful to some of the mentors I had in my life. 
um like uh, without them uh, i would have not been here today um so um so yeah i mean it all started from my undergrad days uh, with uh, with professor gautam apatro and uh, and subsequently uh, all the professors and mentors and researchers from google researchers from ibm uh, researchers from intel uh, who has uh g- g- given me amazing uh, like hospitality and and uh, and i've seen something in me to kind of like push me hard uh, uh so that uh, i i can be a better computer science uh, like student i still consider myself as a student uh, because that's how you learn every day so yeah my deepest gratitude to to my mentors yeah so we with that i'll i'll end uh, my webinar here thank you Uh, thank you, sir, for giving your valuable insights. Thank you so much. Um, I couldn't thank enough to be a part of this webinar today. Uh, thank you for letting us know about uh, formal verification and why it is important. Uh, I agree to all the points that you had mentioned for uh, call for action. I agree to all the points, and I'm sure everyone is going to take a lot from this today. and i'm sure that everyone is like eagerly waiting for questions so without uh, i i don't want to take much time and i would like to request uh, dr shomi malakar hod of the department of computer science kindly uh, proceed with the valedictory session sir over to you okay thank you madam i am shomi malakar and uh, before uh, moving to the ending session i would uh, really like to thank uh, dr mukherjee for such a valuable speech on this one even uh, after before one year i used to teach uh, that software engineering portion and uh, there was a part called uh, testing and the computer science student i feel like that they do program they then they test it themselves that and try to verify that whether the output is correct or not but dr mukherjee has shown something different that by which they can also verify their code and it will be definitely helpful them for them thank you uh, dr mukherjee uh, there are many questions in the uh, chat box i think uh, Dr. Mukherjee, you can also see all those messages. Or should I uh, read out one after another, or will you love to answer yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I can I can see the questions in the chat. Um, yeah, thanks for okay. the questions. Uh, sir, uh, sir, I am just uh, taking a small uh, thing that. Uh, please uh, give the uh, feedback form uh, while we are discussing on the question answer please uh, participant you fill up the uh, feedback form please write your name institutional name and the department name properly in the feedback form uh, during registration i found that someone write like uh, ashutosh colleges okay then someone write iitd okay this kind of uh, you write proper spelling of your institution name because this will be printed in your certificate so it's my request from organizing team that be careful while filling up these things uh, now uh, over to you sir please uh, respond to one after another question and might have been there more question from the audience also later on so we are moving to the yeah. question answer yeah. section sure um <clears throat> okay so the first question is uh, would you kindly recommend some resource for a beginner to introduce uh, to form verification it would be helpful um uh yeah uh, for sure uh, i think uh, the oxford website that i uh, pasted above uh, is uh, a very practical approach to formal verification apart from that i would highly recommend uh, uh, studying uh, like uh, the book uh, by amin nuwali um, and also uh, uh, the the <clears throat> the handbook of satisfiability 
Uh, so this handbook of satisfiability is, uh, I'm sure this is available in some online libraries. I mean, it's, it's the, the book is very costly and I'm sure uh, the libraries uh, in respective colleges can afford that. Uh, but <clears throat> but overall, uh, the handbook of satisfiability uh, uh, gives you exposure to a lot of decision procedures and uh, the latest uh, technology in the SAT solving and also the state space search algorithm for for form verification, the way the fixed points are computed, uh, both in the hardware as well as in the software domain. So these are the two books I would uh, highly recommend. Uh, the Handbook of Satisfiability and the uh, Linear Temporal Logic book by Amid, uh, Professor Amin Nuedi. Uh, there are other resources. Um, um, uh, Shayan, uh, I think uh, my email ID, uh, like if you know my email ID, please feel free to ping me. I can I can point you offline uh, to, to many other resources. So hope that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so moving on to the next one. Uh, uh, this is from uh, GM, sir. Uh, so some idea about machine learning in SAT solver and formal verification. Yeah, this is a great question. So, um, so uh, th th there are a few things in in the SAT solving. So, for example, uh, uh, the way the decision heuristic uh, works. Uh, so the decision heuristic is basically to pick a propositional variable and assign a zero or one variable uh, to that variable. Now, over the years, we have seen uh, several ML algorithms uh, being used to actually uh, see the, the, the search path in a SAT solver and predict what decision heuristic uh, or which propositional variable one can pick to make a decision upon. Uh, and, and and there are applications of ML in choosing uh, a, a good decision variable because as you can imagine, like uh, at every step of a SAT solving, you have to pick a decision variable and you have to assign a zero or one value to it. Now, the iteration uh, for any SAT solver depends on how uh, efficiently you can choose a decision variable so that so as to get a satisfying assignment. Uh, there are applications of uh, ML uh, techniques uh, to 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 pick a decision variable. That's one application I can think of. The, the second application that's uh, already uh, there's there's research paper out there which is about how do you learn from a conflict. Now, uh, what is a conflict in a SAT solver is when you basically uh, when, when there is a a variable which is uh, assigned a zero in one path and uh, one in another path. And, and that leads to a conflict, right? So, uh, which means that you have to uh, you have to backtrack and assign a different variable to that decision variable, and then uh, like you know uh, to avoid that conflict. And every time a conflict happens, it's called a conflict-driven clause learning (CDCL). So, modern sand solving technology uses uh, a CDCL technique, uh, which basically learns a new clause, and, and a clause is a disjunction of propositional formula uh, or propositional variable, right? So. Uh, so every time a new uh, conflict happens, we learn a clause. And this clause is added to the initial propositional formula as a conjunction uh, in order to tell to the algorithm that do not traverse that same path in the future because the, the, that's where a conflict has happened, right? So this learning that we do when a conflict happens by adding a new clause to the existing formula restricts the search space uh, to to better iterate next time so that we can uh, converge on the satisfying assignment faster and the learning of this uh, uh, of this uh, new clause uh, there are uh, semi supervised uh, learning techniques which basically says that when you learn a single clause there are supporting instances that you can learn multiple clauses at the same time from the same conflict in the traditional uh, sad solver uh, when machine learning was not used people used to learn only one clause from a given conflict. But by the pattern of the search space traversal, the current learning algorithm is basically allowing the SAT solver to learn not only one clause, but multiple clauses, which spans from the same conflict. So you can imagine, instead of learning one clause per conflict, you are learning multiple clauses from a given conflict so that you can restrict the search space to these new conflicts in the future. And uh, this is another paper, uh, and I can definitely point you to that, where uh, uh, learning multiple clauses from a conflict happens by predicting using a semi-supervised semi learning technique. Uh, and this is also has proven to be quite beneficial because 
uh, the whole concept of conflict driven clause learning is to learn a fundamentally strong clause so that the sad solver does not go to that search space again and if you can learn multiple clauses then of course it's a it's a great thing for a sad solver because it's not going to traverse that exact path the, the next time uh, or or it's it's not going to traverse multiple paths the next time because it has learned multiple clauses from a single conflict um so these are these are two uh, two kind of uh, very important thing i i i vaguely remember there's another work which uses uh, uh, boolean constraint propagation bcp which is a step followed right after the decision heuristic is being used so once you pick a decision variable you assign a zero or one to that variable and then you do boolean constraint propagation so basically you you, you propagate those constraints and by that propagation other variables gets assigned value of zero and one right now in that bcp step or boolean constraint propagation phase uh, there are uh, machine learning techniques which actually shows that uh, when you do constraint propagation you can even predict the constraint propagation from your past assignment of decision variables and uh, the the result is mixed in that paper uh, where uh, in some cases they have shown that uh, they have got really lucky with machine learning and hence they they can converge faster on a formula to get a satisfying assignment in some other cases when the formula is actually not satisfying which means that the formula does not have a satisfying assignment they really get stuck uh, because the bcp step does not work uh, as as properly as uh, in the case of a satisfying assignment um so uh, i i can i can point you uh, to to this uh, research papers which which talks about this machine learning in sad solving but but great question thanks so one one question actually mm -hmm. hello mm -hmm. yeah uh, you are talking mainly uh, that is a uh, proning proning part that is a logic proning part but not uh, right yeah. today's mm -hmm. uh, machine learning basically depends on data mostly it depends on data or evidence evidences that is right. past history so uh, right. whether this right. type of uh, data data part can be used in your formal verifications or not or sat solver uh, designing or not any kind of uh, uh, data part is right yeah 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 it it can and and let me let me uh, uh, let me put a paper here uh, so so uh, so the, i have pasted a link here uh, an archive link where uh, ml is used uh, to predict the sad solver performance uh, and so let's say a formal verification is using so so just to make sure so uh, a formal verification tool can use multiple sorts of sad solver today right and when it uses a sad solver let's say it dispatches the formula to five sad solvers behind the scene one is from microsoft one is from bullector one is from iics and let's say there are crypto mini sad and other solvers right and the data that it uses to guide which sad solver may perform better on a given design comes from the fact that if the design is data intensive or if the design is control intensive now if you are verifying a floating point design or an arithmetic design that design is traditionally data intensive design there will be a lot of cpu blocks there will be a lot of computation adders multipliers and so on right now if it's a data intensive design there are particular sad solvers which are tuned to handle a formula that's coming out of a arithmetic design such as a, a cpu but if it's it's a control intensive design such that let's say a, 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 an arbiter logic right a bus arbitration logic or maybe a, a, a program with a lot of control for paths that data or that characteristic of the design will decide which underlying sad solver to to give this formula so that it can solve faster so this design characteristic can be explored by the formal verification tool uh, which uses multiple sad solvers in the back end and based on the design characteristic it can choose one particular sad solver it it throws the problem to uh, different sad solvers but it exactly knows from the characteristics and the previously solved uh, like you know results Uh, that if it's a data intensive design this particular sad solver the decision heuristic used inside the sad solver is tuned to solve better compared to a control flow intensive design D does that does that make sense yes. okay thank you thank you very much sure yeah that's a great question um okay so next is anupam uh, so 
so anupam says the problem of side is hard what do you think about the role of ml or other techniques in, in solving sad problems it is difficult for ml technique to give exact solution like traditional approach does so how will you uh, how will it cope up with performance particularly accuracy um yeah i think i have answered the first part of the question but about the second part of the question um uh, well i mean it's it's a deterministic algorithm right uh, so uh which means uh, the the solution has to be either satisfying or 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 not satisfying uh, there is uh, of course there are like probabilistic model checking which assigns uh, probable pro, like you know uh, probabilistic values to to the to the satisfying assignment but if we are talking about simple boolean sat uh the the the, the notion of accuracy is is uh, is not present because either it has to be uh, an exact solution which means there is a satisfying assignment or there is no satisfying assignment uh, to the formula in which case the formula uh, is unsatisfiable um so uh, uh so i i guess the machine learning technique uh, although they apply machine learning technique but it doesn't affect the functionality functionality of solving in terms of uh, finding the correct assignment uh if it's a probabilistic model checking where uh, where there is a prob prob pro probabilistic value associated with every satisfying assignment then perhaps machine learning may give uh, like some notion of accuracy to that uh, satisfying assignment but if it's not a probabilistic uh, sad solver uh, which where a satisfying assignment uh, always have a probability of 1 uh, then it it will always be a deterministic uh, assignment I hope that's clear. Yes, sir. This is clear. Okay, cool. Uh, so moving on to the next one, what's the role of a priori analysis in formal verification of the design? If not, what's role? What's the role of heuristic in avoiding an exhaustive search? Um, yeah, again, this is a great question. Uh, so uh, I I I I don't know what you mean by a priori analysis. Um, uh, and I don't know what you mean by disjoint here. But guessing from the question. Uh, from the last part of the question, I think uh, there's a big role for heuristic in 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 any exhaustive search, right? Because uh, end of the day, if you have n variables, then you have two to the power n number of uh, states to traverse, right? Uh, so definitely, like you know, you have exponential number of states uh, for any given uh, number of variables. So uh, so. Uh, there are there are heuristics and that's why i told formal verification tools uh, presently are very good in finding a counter example which means uh, finding a satisfying assignment to the formula uh, but if you are to prove a, a correctness of a design which is to say that a given sad formula is unsatisfiable uh, then oftentimes it takes more time and and things become uh, uh, like uh, you have to apply a lot of machine power right a lot of cpu power to scale up the sad solver a lot of parallelization applying ml techniques to 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 delegate the problem to multiple sad solvers and so on um, so uh, one of the heuristic that the that the uh, that the formal verification tools apply is to is to constrain the search space and that's where assumption comes into picture so i have shown you the use of assertion uh, but the use of assumption is basically to, to say that if a design is given and you want to verify properties for the design only for a given uh, for a given particular value of a number then you just put an assumption saying that uh, I care about verifying this property under under this particular assumption, right? Uh, in case of GCD example, I've given you, if you specify that if x greater than zero and y greater than zero, then you are basically saying that find GCD for positive numbers, right? So things like that. So uh, it's it's basically uh, one way to uh, like prune the search space and uh, to constrain the design. For for example, in case of a CPU design. Uh, you can basically constrain your formal verification to only, let's say, the fetch, uh, the fetch unit, only the decode unit, only the execution unit. Even in this pipeline, let's say you are verifying a pipeline design uh, where you have fetch, decode, execution, and write back, uh, but you are constraining your design, your CPU design, to say that I only am interested in verifying an arithmetic operation such as plus or a minus. Right, uh, and you don't care about, let's say, a no op. You don't care about, let's say, uh, any other move or delete operation. You only care about arithmetic operations. So you tell to the formal verification tool that, look, I want to verify my pipeline design, but the operations I'm interested in are adder, subtractor, 
uh, and few other uh, div divider and few other other arithmetic operation. You can even go on to specify what kind of numbers you want to uh, you want these arithmetic operations to perform. It can be integer, it can be floating. So there's a lot of constraining the search space that you can do uh, to 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 single out a case that you verify first, and then you go on to verify the next case. Uh, and and uh, practitioners in Intel and Apple do it as part of their day-to-day -day job, where uh, like just throwing the entire CPU with billions of transistors to a SAT solver doesn't work. So you have to partition your design based on the instruction type, as well as the type of uh, the numbers, for example, integer versus floating point and so on, in order to uh, avoid the exhaustive search uh, using this kind of heuristics. So I hope, <coughs> hope that answers your, your question, Hardik. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next one, is AutoML going to kill the data science jobs? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I may not be uh, um, like the right person to comment on that, uh, but I, 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 I would only encourage that, you know, data science is, 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 is huge, right? Um, and uh, data science, I would say like most jobs in the US, in, in at least in, uh, uh, IT industry like Amazon and Microsoft and uh, this kind of companies, LinkedIn, uh, like you know they 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 hire a lot of data science scientists, uh, right? Uh, and I think there's there's no threat uh, to data science jobs as of now. Uh, and uh, whoever studies data science um, in the US or in Europe or elsewhere uh, doesn't have much uh, difficulty in, in in a job. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I, I may not have the full picture that uh, you have showed up. So yeah, pardon me if my answer was not not prompt, not correct. Uh, okay, so there's another question from Sion. Um, is automation or formal verification same as ML model where model is built around data? Is, is it possible for a formal verification model to escape some cases or it's something same as during machine in inertia loop? What is the relationship of the formal verification model with ML model and automated? Um, well, uh, it's it's a mathematical guarantee. So, uh, like, uh, if you're not constraining your search space, then of course it it guarantees. And if it is able to find a solution, then of course it's guaranteeing that the whole design is safe. Or if it's find a satisfying assignment, then it finds a counterexample trace. Uh, so, uh, and and again, like you know, the model that you mentioned here, it's it's not an ML model. It's basically a more of an automaton, right? Uh, where you uh, build this controlled data flow graph from a given design, um, and that constitutes your underlying model on which you verify your design. So, ML models are are different. Uh, so, uh, I would say like. Uh, when we talk about models uh, in formal verification world, we talk about controlled data flow graph, which is the intermediate representation that comes out of a compiler uh, after parsing your design, right? Uh, but ML models are, are, are very different, and uh, it's 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 not part of the technology that uh, that that we built uh, for formal verification. I hope that's clear. Uh, okay, so moving on to the next one. Um, Talk out some time for us in one more time. Okay, so this is just a comment from Saikat. So thank you, Saikat. Yeah, I'll definitely try to like uh, yeah get get some time out and do more such webinars in the future. Yeah, thanks. Um, next from Aloy is also a comment. Um, yeah, thank you, Aloy. Uh, we'll definitely try in the future. Um. Next one is from Ankit. Um, um, okay, so this is again a comment. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Ankit. Uh, hope you like the talk. Um, okay, so next one from Anamul. Uh, so this is a feedback form. Uh, next one is from Saikat. Uh, please share some ML tools to start exploring. Uh, yeah, uh, Saikat, please reach out to me um, offline. Uh, uh, like uh, this talk was mostly for uh, if formal verification, but if you are interested in uh, machine learning tools, uh, like uh, I have, I have, I have uh, recently explored uh, like many machine learning tools, especially for clustering work, for how to cluster uh, like programs of similar types uh, based on their control flow graphs, um, and in that. Uh, 
so um and 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 python libraries as so yeah I, i'll definitely get uh, some pointers to you um and then so it's a question from Ankit. How software play a major role in the fifth generation warfare based on cyber security? Uh, this is a great question. And I think uh, this will only get worse uh, because of uh, uh, so many, uh, so many uh, kind of, uh, because, because there's, there's a cold war in our generation, right? Between superpowers like uh, Russia, China, America. So if you look at the geopolitics, it's, it's very crit, like, you know, it's, it's, it's nasty. Like, you know, Countries like Russia hack into U.S. Uh, government every single day, uh, and U.S. boast about uh, building the most safest, uh, and 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 they have like you know a huge penalty for breaching their cybersecurity. So, this kind of warfare will continue going, uh, like you know, in the future as well. Uh, but software definitely plays a major role, and I I, I think. Uh, I think there would be always a vulnerability that one can expose uh, or one can breach uh, to uh, to to raise this kind of cybersecurity threats. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so that's why uh, U.S. government is spending a lot of money in 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 security uh, technologies, right? Uh, even in the cloud computing, we we guarantee customers that if you log into your cloud and if you transfer your entire bank account, like for example, Bank of America is using AWS Cloud to uh, to host all their uh, customers' data. So imagine like uh, the, the like records of millions of customers, their bank account, their credit card passwords, and every single thing with AWS. And AWS is is a cloud uh, computing uh, platform. So, so security becomes a huge role uh, uh, in, in such paradigm, and uh, and that's why there is a, a huge investment in this domain. Uh, and even I would say like uh, from. Uh, cryptography perspective, like building new cryptographic uh, uh, like uh, technology that uh, has enabled uh, this kind of uh, online payment system, like what PayPal and uh, uh, I don't know in India what they are using now, but in the US it's it's PayPal and other uh, like uh, payment transfer platforms that use this uh, a SHA keys, right, for uh, 256 bit keys for secure cryptography payment transfer. So this kind of modernization of our cryptographic technologies as well as uh, cyber security uh, would definitely be helpful and if you are studying it from as an undergrad project i would highly encourage focusing on security because this is one aspect that's definitely going to be important in the future both from a software as well as uh, from a hardware perspective uh okay um so then there are uh Okay, so there's a question from Shreya, quite a helpful and interesting session. Thanks, thank you, Shreya. Uh, there's a question from Saikad. Please share some advice you think we should start exploring. Uh, uh, I would say like follow the principles that I mentioned in the slide. There's no one secret sauce to success, right? Uh, I would say, uh, like the, the if you had known the road to success, if we all would have uh, like you know walked that road, but we don't know what's the road to success, right? And that's the interesting thing. Uh, but I would say, like, keep the curiosity uh, going and uh, like uh, never shy from uh, from failing because we all try to succeed, but it's important to fail as well. Um, so and, and and just you know. Uh, because you are blessed with computer science knowledge, just apply your knowledge, uh, go beyond your textbooks, uh, uh, ask faculty questions, and just engage yourself. I think the career uh, will uh, options will open up if you just eagerly try to engage yourself in active discussions and uh, trying out these tools uh, yourself. Uh, that would be my only advice. Uh, uh, just follow like, you know, big people like, you know, uh, there are so many stalwarts in this domain, uh, like starting from uh, like, you know, researchers in ML, Andrew NG, uh, who, who gives a lot of lecture in uh, Stanford University. Um, so, yeah, there, there are like so many tons of uh, like, you know, uh, online resources that you can you can you can uh, get advice from uh, if you're interested in, uh, in in any particular domain. So yeah, that would be my only advice. But but start writing code and and start like you know, uh, like uh, uh, exploring uh, the subject of your choice by engaging more into practice uh, uh, in parallel with what you are studying uh, in theory. 
So that would be my advice. Hope that's clear. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think I answered all the questions. Uh, this last one from Aloy. Can we contact you with that email if we face any confusion with our course or career? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, feel free to just you know write an email. Uh, I might be time, but I'll try my best to get back uh, to your questions and queries uh, uh, as and when I, I get time. But uh, definitely I'll, I'll get back. Yeah, so keep posting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you have answered all the questions for the participant. Uh, any from participant, if please, uh, you can unmute yourself and can ask, sir. Otherwise, I will ask one or two questions to uh, Dr. Mukherjee, just for curiosity. If you have any question, then uh, please ask. Otherwise, I will go to the end. Uh, of this session and I will ask Mukherjee one or two questions, not more because uh, he is already, I, he is not well uh, physically uh, today, yet uh, he has given us so much time. Okay, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, just for curiosity, what the actual scenario that motivate you to choose this uh, topic that is satisfiable to problem because there are so many things in hand uh, even at your time also to choose choose your career path but what actually motivates you to choose such a step because uh, I think if you answer to this question then many of uh, the participants will understand that how they can find their own problem also because, because problem may be different. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I, I worked in multiple projects during my undergrad uh, and uh, none of them was related to uh, formal verification, but um, I got exposed to formal verification during my uh, master's thesis and uh, Mm, and uh, <clears throat> I, I was always uh, close to like developing algorithms and uh, search space exploration um, always uh, always was interesting to me like you know when someone works with search space especially looking how google works right um, so uh, like you know anything that's that has to do with automata and, and graph algorithms uh, that oftentimes triggers my mind um, and I wanted the right mixture of uh, of 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 proposition of of logic and uh, algorithms, uh, and uh, and and I, I guess part of it has to do with the fundamental uh, undergrad course, like you know that uh, that uh, f starting from Ashutosh College and uh, like you know uh, Science College, where uh, the the fundamental of automata theory and. Uh, uh, algorithm design was uh, pretty uh, clear to me and I always wanted to combine this two uh, together but I was never sure that uh, formal verification is the subject I'd land into uh, but uh, when I got exposed uh, to formal verification during my IIT thesis uh, I thought it's a right combination of uh, logic uh, where you can apply you know uh, first or as well as you can apply automata theory uh, and also you can have a chance to design search space algorithm so um, of course I read a lot of like other subjects like networking and database and uh, I, I know a lot of great works done my, by my peers in those domains but uh, for me uh, I think the the secret sauce was just uh, my liking towards automata theory and algorithm design and I found formal verification to be a perfect balance uh, to apply both this, uh, both these ideas uh, from my undergrad days. Uh, and once I got exposed to this, uh, I just, uh, you know, kept on going. Um, I sometimes see a lot of people change their careers, uh, moving on from one place to another. But I felt like, um, uh, like safe and reliable software uh, sometimes, uh, like, like this is the future, right? So sometimes you have to take, take a step back as an academician and also th see that how, uh, <coughs> how the future looks like. And I saw like no company in earth would survive without uh, without validating their designs, right? Uh, it's it's just the ground truth. Um, so uh, 
instead of like focusing on other domains, uh, I just, even in Amazon, what I'm doing today is like, uh, is uh, plain old program analysis, right? Like finding, uh, writing tools to find bugs in other code. Um, and this is all uh, that uh, that started from uh, my uh, undergrad days, love towards automata theory and uh, algorithm design. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I would I, I'm also open to like you know machine learning because this is where uh, because if you see new technologies coming, you you can't be rigid that you know I'll always apply conventional technologies. You have to be open about accepting new technologies because if you see good research results, oftentimes it triggers your mind that look I can also do uh, build a tool which uses this technique and can be much faster or maybe be more scalable, uh, and and that's why I found a lot of interesting. Uh, you know, uh, side domains uh, where I can apply machine learning in formal verification. And this is what exactly I'm doing in Amazon now, where a uh, lot of uh, like clustering work, a lot of machine learning work uh, to to replace a human in the loop for code reviews. Um, so, but my ground has always been uh, verification and, and, and my love towards understanding this topic more and more. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, it's just the love towards automata and, and algorithm design. Okay, so it's uh, definitely from your under, uh, answer, but I can understand that we should always look on or concentrate on our basic that that domain I am strong, so I can build my future career surrounding this itself. Um, yeah, but that's, that, that should not be a hard constraint again. I, I mean, it worked for me, uh, it, like doesn't mean that it will work for others. Uh, so I, I really want to, like, you know, students to be open about their, uh, career choices. I mean, I, uh, I feel like I have, uh, I have been, uh, digging deep in this, in this domain for many years and, uh, uh, and, and there's so much to learn still, right? Uh, so I'm not done with this domain, but if if in a day I feel like I'm done with this domain, I might move to, let's say, uh, a new kind of uh, programming language paradigm or something something completely new. Uh, but uh, but I guess from a career choice perspective, uh, since, b because technology like you know technology changes very frequently, right? Uh, and uh, like uh, if our fundamentals are clear, we can adapt ourselves in, 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 in other technologies as well. Um, so, but uh, I've seen many, many people who have done their PhD in, in a topic have completely gone on to do different things in the industry. Um, and uh, I myself was kind of like uh, doing a lot of uh, like uh, automata theory verification. And now here in Amazon, I'm doing day-to-day -day machine learning, applying machine learning in program verification, right? So, uh, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, there's no secret sauce to it. It's just uh, the love, the love towards uh, uh, that that one has towards their their subject that they understand better. Okay, thank you, sir. Once again, there is a question from Sriti uh, Ghosh. Uh, she is asking that uh, she want to build her career in formal verification, like you did. Uh, so. Where, whether she should follow honors, PTEC, MS, and PhD, this kind of curriculum, one after another? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I, I have uh, studied many years, uh, but <laughs> I would say, like, you know, uh, uh, there, there, there can be, like, you know, uh, a much uh, uh, shorter, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, a shorter uh, uh, thing to climb. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be honors, BTEC, MS, PhD. I mean, uh, like you are smart enough to like you know directly be in, a, in an MS program or a PhD program. So uh, this is just what worked better for me. Uh, gear, like in the in the time I was studying. Uh, but uh, if you feel uh, you you want to pursue uh, direct MS right after your honors program, then there are a lot of universities in India, outside India, where you can do MS uh, and then a PhD. Um, so this is the track I have chosen, but uh, uh, like feel free to explore other other tracks uh, as well. Uh, because if, if, if the time to reach PhD is shorter, uh, then you gain much more uh, like time uh, building your industry experience post PhD or doing a post or post PhD, right? 
Um, so yeah, just just explore uh, more more options how you can do a PhD. Uh, but but important thing is that if you're interested in PhD, uh, do a PhD. I mean, uh, we need more computer scientists in in our domain, uh, not only in formal verification but in all domains because that that's the need of the hour. Uh, but the way you get to the PhD doesn't doesn't really matter. I mean, choose choose your own path. Okay, sir. Thank you once again. The last uh, question from my end. Uh, it may be uh, it may sound something different, uh, but I feel this could even not related to this topic once again. Uh, I think whenever you have started uh, with the formal verification. It was not that much buzzword. Uh, I may be wrong because I do not know the history of that uh, that mass. I don't have, but uh, can you suggest at present scenario since you are in uh, industry that what could be some domain or some topic choice for the students that can help them to build their career because th some of them are in first year, some of them are in second year and they will do their graduation or masters after two, three years. Then in the actual job market, they will be after five years or six years. So what they should target from now, two or three sessions so that they can build their career or can find some opportunity at that moment. Even there may be some technology which are, we may say that in the dying state. So if they choose such, anyway then that career may fail in future so is there any suggestion that uh, that could be uh, some buzzword after five or six years what is your take on this and this will be my last question to you sir um yeah sure i mean this this is a hard one predicting future is always difficult but yeah i can try um, so I think uh, I, th I think yeah, like given given what I see, uh, the roadmap. Uh, uh, I mean, especially like you know, everything starts from US and then slowly it moves on to developing countries. Uh, so if I if I see the trend in the US, um, I, I I think a lot of the things would be would be uh, done by uh, like uh, deep learning and machine learning technologies in the future. Um, uh, and uh, just to just to give you some example, uh, autonomous car uh, driving uh, is is a reality now. Um, so uh, the, the, there's a lot of like uh, like uh, cool technologies in image processing and and and, and video video analytics and uh, uh, and, and that domain which which is required. Uh, uh, signal processing, uh, th this kind of things are required to build an auto autonomous car, uh, because in order to go from a level four to level five, which is the full autonomy, uh, like th there has to be a huge, uh, uh, there has to be a huge shift in the technology. And uh, uh, and uh, if I see uh, in the future, uh, like uh, the 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 communication or. or the the transportation system is going to change uh, significantly by 2050 and so so um and 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 what we need more uh, along those lines is is more students and more carriers in 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 uh, domains like image processing uh, and and it's it's a no brainer that machine learning is going to survive for for the next foreseeable future right um so anyone pursuing machine learning of course it's a buzzword uh, but uh, it's also a reality that uh, more and more uh, like, you know, uh, self-assisting systems uh, where uh, instead of a human interacting with someone uh, as a service provider, uh, a, 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 a thing like uh, Siri or uh, Google uh, self-assisting system is helping human to find their answers, right? So uh, so some, some things like, you know, which, which, again, going back to this automation thing, which automates our... Uh, our response with respect to a machine is is very important, and to enable that technology, I think image processing, um, uh, computer graphics uh, is is an excellent domain. I mean, computer graphics, image processing, these are like some of the top top domains that people are studying these days because of 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 the great potential that autonomous driving uh, will will bring in the future. 
Uh, so imagine human changing completely their behavior instead of they driving their car, a machine is driving their car. So uh, so automation uh, will enforce us to like you know uh, like do these kind of things and. Uh, uh, and, and machine learning is applied in all these domains, right? Uh, image processing uh, 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 and, and uh, like, you know, uh, like uh, building a uh, localization mapping, uh, the, the, the technologies that are used in self-driving cars. Um, so, so this is one domain. Uh, the second domain, I think, uh, so, so, so just to finish on the first domain, so machine learning is a no-brainer. So if you are doing machine learning, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer that your career is going to flourish. Uh, but that's not the end of the world uh, because uh, although formal verification is not a buzzword, uh, but if you look at a budget of a company like Facebook and Microsoft on formal verification, it's astonishingly high. So they recruit a lot of PhD students uh, in this domain because they cannot ship anything without formally verifying that product, right? So some domains are not a buzzword domain, but still that survives and has been surviving for the past 30, 40, 50 years, right? Uh, we, we tend to do everything in, 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 the, in the landscape of machine learning from the lens of machine learning. Uh, so if anyone is choosing machine learning career, no brainer, go for it. Uh, but if anyone is doing non-machine learning domains, such as, you know, network security or cyber security, um, uh, that, that's also a, like really uh, good potential and, and has a really excellent career uh, career uh, development uh, graph going forward. Um, so, uh, so, so if you follow the train for next fifty years, and if I am someone to predict the next fifty years, I feel automation, uh, climate, uh, and uh, like you know, uh, yeah, more automation and m more more uh, like climate oriented things where uh, everything will be. Uh, like, you know, just based on the CO2 emission that you do. Uh, I don't know how computer science would relate to CO2 emission, maybe running some uh, solar panel or some wind turbine through some sort of software programs. But again, there, there is a huge potential for security there because of power grid security and so on. Um, so these would be some of my predictions. Uh, these are the, the buzz, uh, the, the buzzwords or the buzz uh, career growth, but there are uh, like lesser known career growths, which are equally important and which are equally uh, like, you know, challenging and rewarding. Um, and uh, I would just say like, you know, keep your eyes open and, and just follow the trend, uh, but don't shy away from kind of like learning new domains. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there any question? Professor Mahapatro, uh, GM sir is there, Untika ma'am is there, uh, then I can see Atri ma'am is there, uh, Shagurika ma'am is also there. Is there any question or we should close the program? Rajdeep? Uh, yeah, sir. <laughs> Actually, uh, two of your uh, BTEC classmates uh, have uh, present now Your One is Mittunjoy Choudhury and oh, I see. Okay. Uh, Subir Mohato. Oh, hi, Mithunjoy. Hi, Shubir. Mithunjoy. Hello, Rajiv. Hi, Mithunjoy. Yeah, nice to, yes. nice to see you. Yes. One again, for a second, yes, yes, one again, for a second. Subir, I see. Subir, what is it? Subir, you are. Subir, what is it? Sir, we are actually in live, then should I okay. take my Normally, okay. Okay, take it. Let's set a little. Okay. The close the meeting. Yes, yes. Any, any, uh, uh, any, any, uh, any question? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rajdi Mukherjee. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah. Once again, thank you, because without you, this would not be possible. Even so many informative information you have provided to the new brain or new or future brain of computer. Uh, they will be motivated by your lecture. I also want to thank all of my members and staff members in the department and uh, also uh, chairpersons and the members from ITPL, young professionals and computer society, and uh, also the governing body members and uh, other IQC members of 
Ashutosh College. Last but not the least, I would really uh, thankful to the IT section of computer uh, of Ashutosh College for providing us the uh, IT help. And with this, I am requesting the IT cell to stop uh, the live in uh, YouTube. We are closing the session here from YouTube live. And Somnatha, uh, uh, are you there? Somnatha. Uh, let me just close the thing. Thank you again. Uh, you may stay here and can discuss. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Samir. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Really enjoyed uh, all the conversations and mm -hmm. and the interaction. Yeah. Uh, Somnath, please uh, stop the YouTube uh, live. <laughs> <laughs>